All right, good morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm get free break. It was hard to get up this with me. I have to say, I was like not excited to be here, but then as all of you started to come in and I saw your faces, it felt like it had been so long and I got excited to win. So um, I'm glad to see you. I'm a little bit sick, so I'll put this back here. Uh, hopefully I'm at the end of it, but uh, did anyone anyone want to share anything fun about their spring break? I could go on about my spring school. I'll ask you first. Yeah. Oh, that's actually, it was, that's cool. I've never been back since then. It's like, it's like, the, if we know about that studio and keyword thing. Yeah. That, like, the set. That's really fun. It's awesome. Anybody else? Anything fun? You know, it's going to be worth having. Yeah. It's a place as well. Nice. I haven't been there in forever. I just, my, my middle child would love it. I should, I should go. It's been too long. <laughs> What's your favorite ride? Then? So my personal favorite is probably Tatsu. Mm -hmm. um, but that one also consistent because it's more than that. <laughs> but I do like that. I've also had a lot of very fun. Anybody else? Yes. I managed to eat 36 croissants yes. on my cruise, right? So one for each person who was enrolled the last day I had to eat an arm. So I was like, I'm falling behind my daughter Paisley and I usually have a croissant competition, but her stomach was hurting, so she was way off, so I didn't feel pressure. She only ate 24. I was like, that's weak, Paisley. Last time she ate 50, right? So um, I had to push myself hard, but I managed to eat a croissant for each of you, right? And the people who weren't here. Uh, I kissed a seal named Samantha. <laughs> that was like the most exciting part of our cruise. My kids picked a sea lion playtime and kiss. It was one of our experiences in Puerto and so we literally got in this like pool with this seal named Samantha, and we all had to kiss her. I was like, I, I don't want to. <laughs> like, I, I tried my best not to, right? But I got a big old sloppy kiss from Samantha on the cheek. My mother in law went to kiss her and had fish all over her face. I'm like, see, that's why I don't want to. No, no, I'm good. Uh, but I kissed a seal. I gained five pounds, which was a little under my goal, but I was proud of myself anyway. Uh, probably all those croissants, right? And then cake classic. Uh, I rode a horse on the beach, which was a lot of fun. And it was freezing. It was so cold, right? Uh, way colder than I was expecting. We came back to like rain. So uh, very choppy. I never get seasick, never. And the last night was so bad that I threw up. So um, it was it was a little rough, but I feel bad complaining. I can't complain too much, right? It was a, it was a lot of fun, but, but still. Samantha was probably the, or Cassandra? I don't care, I can't remember her name. Right? <laughs> Samantha or Cassandra. One of the seals, right? Uh, there were a couple. Anyway, uh, I had another thought that left me. Now I'm thinking about all those croissants. I miss the croissants a little bit. Uh, we're in our last third of the semester now. So it's kind of wild if we look at our syllabus, we will now move into right this last chunk. So we don't have that long left, right? This last part always goes so fast. But what we'll look at, we'll look at schizophrenia personality disorders, childhood disorders, aging, and then end with forensic psychology. So that's kind of our next few weeks that we have uh, together. It's only about a month, which is wild. Again, it always seems to go really fast from here. Uh, our second exam is behind us. Uh, I do have the statistics from that I can share with reference to exam number two, which feels like a long time ago at this point, but just to give you kind of where everyone fell, the high score was a 99. There were three people who got a 99. Uh, the low score was a 74. So not a huge range, which is great. Everybody did quite well. The average uh, was a 92, and the amount of time people took was about an hour and three minutes was the average. So again, uh, really nicely done. Most of you did a beautiful job. We have one more exam. The last exam is not cumulative. It's just a third test. So um, everything from today forward. So um, continue to use it as like a learning opportunity. I, I think all of you, if not the vast majority of you, should be quite happy with how you did. Um, but you can still kind of tweak things if you feel like you wish you had done a little better. Right. Um, I also graded all of the second parts of the paper. I did that before I left, right? So I didn't want to come back to it. Uh, and so our final paper is due in a few weeks. We'll start talking about that probably next week or um, or so. We'll start kind of building into that a little bit. 
But are there any kind of questions about the exam or any of the past stuff, anything from before? Anything else before we move forward? All right. So the topic that we'll jump into today is uh, schizophrenia. Right? And several of you have characters in your in your shows uh, that have you suspect have schizophrenia or personality disorders, which is the next unit. So hopefully this will be really helpful uh, for a lot of you as you're still trying to kind of figure out your characters. Uh, schizophrenia is by far the most severe disorder that we've covered, right? When we talk about schizophrenia, schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder. And when someone is psychotic, it means that they have lost contact with reality. So this one by far is the most severe. We haven't been talking about psychotic disorders. We could consider the others more like neurotic, but this one, we have a loss of touch with reality. And the nature of this disorder makes it really difficult to live with. People are hearing and seeing things that aren't there. They're having odd beliefs about the world around them, right? Strange and uh, like abnormal motor abnormalities and facial expressions, a lot of symptoms come with schizophrenia, enough so that they used to actually divide it up into different types of schizophrenia, but they got rid of that in the DSM-5. They just made it one. Uh, but when we look at this disorder, it, it's gone by a couple of names over time. So just to kind of um, share this with you. So the first recorded account was about 1800. Now, we suspect this has been around a lot longer. Like if we look at some of the things like the witch trials and abnormal behavior through history, a lot of it could be viewed as schizophrenia, maybe hallucinations and so on. But the first recorded account in like medical and psychiatric literature came around like 1800 or so. And in the 1800s, we actually thought this was a type of dementia because people's minds were like declining. So something like Alzheimer's almost, and we called it Demonse Percose. Which means early dementia. Now the dementias, which we'll talk about in a few chapters, people don't get better with dementia, they progressively get worse. And sometimes with schizophrenia, people just get better on their own, right? About um, 25 to 50% of people actually can fall out of um, active psychotic episodes. So around like 1900, 1908 to be specific, we turn, uh, coined the term schizophrenia, which means a splitting of the mind. a little deceiving because people tend to see something like splitting of the mind and they think of like split personalities or multiple personalities. And this is really different from that. Schizophrenia, people only have one personality, right? One personality, but it's fragmented and there are all these like psychotic features to it versus dissociative identity disorder. People have multiple personalities. Now we could get really wild and say one of those multiple personalities could have schizophrenia, uh, be really rare, but it's possible. But with this one, I called it a splitting of the mind because everything was so fragmented and disconnected. But I think sometimes just the name of this tends to be a little confusing. Very different from dissociative identity disorder, which we covered in the last unit. So ever since about like 1908, it's been viewed as schizophrenia, but it was thought to be almost like a dementia before that, right? And something that um, really well documented through history and very, very difficult to treat. We tried a lot of bizarre things to help people who had this disorder, like leeches and bleeding and uh, lobotomies and all sorts of strange procedures. And a lot of them were obviously very, very un unsuccessful. Uh, we'll talk a lot today about the different symptoms of schizophrenia. As I said, there are quite a few, but I wanna show you a little video as like an intro um, one of the more famously documented uh, patients with schizophrenia, his name is Gerald. Um, it's an old video, but I think it's a really great example. I want you to pay attention to the things he says, because they're odd, right, which is very typical with this disorder. And then also pay attention to like his behavior, right? He's got a lot of like weird motor movements 
um, which can also be typical of this disorder. So let me play this for you just as kind of an intro. Um, and then we'll like, obviously, it's very different from person um, to person. But Gerald shows a lot of different signs of schizophrenia, right? He has some things that he says that are really abnormal. Like to say something like the picture has a headache is an odd thing to say. It's really like, uh, you know, really humanizing, right? Something that's inanimate. Right. He jumps from thought to thought very easily uh, and his thoughts seem very disconnected, right? which is also typical. Uh, the motor movement stuff of constantly spinning is another thing that you sometimes see. Again, uh, so many different symptoms. They tend to fall into three main groups. Um, and that's, again, what we're focused mainly on today. There are positive ones, negative ones, and psychomotor ones. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and enough so that, like, as I mentioned earlier, we used to have five different subtypes of it. So you could have, like, paranoid or disorganized, where there were a bunch of different ways it could present. Uh, but people tended to overlap so much that they just got rid of it. But, yeah, the biggest reason it looks so different is there are just so many different symptoms. And you only have to have a, a certain number of them uh, in order to have the disorder. So it can look wildly different from person to person. I think he shows the most, like, classic portrayal of this, but yeah, it can be a very different presentation. Any other like questions or reactions or thoughts? Yeah. Is the psychosis just a variety? So think of psychosis as like a broad term. So um, schizophrenia is a type of psychosis. So psychosis isn't necessarily a disorder. It's a, a category where we say someone has lost contact with reality. So people can have psychotic episodes of bipolar disorder, for example. Sometimes when people are manic, um, in an extreme manic state, they might hallucinate or have like delusions of grandeur. So psychosis isn't necessarily a disorder as much as like an umbrella term. I'm glad you asked. Any other thoughts or questions? Anything else for the moment? A lot of examples of uh, this disorder in the media, and I have a couple of clips to obviously share with you today. Uh, it's a relatively common disorder, unfortunately. About one out of 100 people struggle with schizophrenia. But, uh, and again, a lot of people do kind of get better on their own, but it can be a very difficult disorder to live with, uh, depending on what symptoms you're, you're presenting and how severe they are. So uh, we're going to start with the positive symptoms. Psychology loves to do this, right? We say positive. What is your instant thought when you hear positive? Good, right? Good. These are the good symptoms of schizophrenia. No, uh, they're the additions, like kind of like with classical conditioning, you're adding, right? So here we're looking at additions or excesses to kind of normal, typical behavior. So these are by far are the most common symptoms of schizophrenia and oftentimes the most damaging and difficult to live with. But positive means an excess, like a bizarre addition to normal thoughts, emotions, or behaviors. And there are a few here, right? delusions, loose associations, hallucinations, and inappropriate affect. And we see some of these in Gerald. And again, these are by far the most common symptoms that people tend to display. So uh, delusions, let's start with these. Delusions are false beliefs about reality that have no basis in fact. So this is a thought or a belief that you hold. Right. We tend to confuse delusions and hallucinations. Delusions are the thoughts that we have that aren't grounded in the world around us. And there's a lot of different types of delusions that people can have. The most common by far are paranoid delusions. If someone has a paranoid delusion, they tend to think that someone is out to get them. You're being watched, right? There's a camera up in that projector up there recording everything that you say and do, right? Hopefully not, right? Uh, but could be, right? There are cameras everywhere. People are following you. People are out to get you. Conspiracy theories, really, really common for people to have delusions of paranoia. They might have multiple locks to prevent people from getting into their apartment or their house. They might uh, you know, look at headlines and look for connections and have conspiracy theories about things happening in the world. Or it could just be like an extreme lack of trust in people around you. But paranoid delusions are by far one of the more common ways that people tend to have false beliefs in schizophrenia. Uh, the next one is a delusion of grandeur. Believing that you're someone really important, 
right? Believing that you are like uh, oftentimes like a religious figure or a very prominent um, like political figure, not uncommon for people who have schizophrenia to wind up homeless. There's a very strong correlation between homelessness and schizophrenia. Um, oftentimes because people kind of fall through the cracks. It's hard to live a normal, typical life. And I have definitely had a few um, instances of seeing people who are homeless and schizophrenic or have schizophrenia. Um, I remember one very vividly. We went to a conference in San Francisco. Um, this was years back. It was like a psychology conference. And we were walking to the conference and on the corner, there was a man dressed in like a full robe, like as if he were Jesus, spouting the word of God, right? Um, screaming at us, right? As we walked by that we were all going to hell, right? Uh, very common to see that, right? Like delusions of believing you're someone really grand or important and that you have power over other people. Same trip, I got flashed by um, a guy in a Santa costume. <laughs> it was like the most memorable trip to San Francisco. In my mind, I'm like, oh, San Francisco is so colorful, right? Uh, this guy was dressed in a full Santa outfit and we walked by and he flashed us. I had no desire to see that. Uh, I found the other guys are one telling us we were going to hell much more interesting. Right? But uh, really common to have these delusions of thinking you're important. And then you might even act like it. Like if you believe that you're the president, you might walk around and act like the president. Right? It doesn't have any basis in reality, but it's a kind of delusional thought that you have. The last one are called delusions of reference. And these are, to me, always um, really interesting. It's when you read into stuff, right? You give special meaning to things that are meaningless. And how many of you, anyone in here ever done an escape room before? I love escape rooms. It's been too long. Right, a few of you? You have to, like, nitpick every detail in the room, right? When you're in an escape room, I almost feel like you have to have delusions of reference, where you have to, like, there's a scratch on the wall. Is that, like, a code for a number? It, there's three scratches. It's a three. That means something. People who have delusions of reference do that with everything, right? So I'm looking around for inspiration here, right? Uh, why is it that we have that map right there? Like, why is it right there in that paper next to it? See how it's folded over the way that it is? What is it hiding? There's a pattern here. So no one sat in that third desk or this second desk. If I could just figure out the pattern, then I could figure out what's going on and I could break it. Why is that thing on the wall back there, right above your head? Like, what is that? <laughs> Not to make you scared, right? But it's that kind of stuff. It's like constant. Every little thing must be meaningful, right? And it's probably stuff that means nothing, but you're reading it. It's hard to stop. I'm like looking for more things now. Right? I don't know. Uh, but it tends to be something where every little thing is meaningful in some way. And people go nuts over this, right? You literally drive yourself mad looking at every little tiny thing, trying to find patterns and meanings and connections among things that might be meaningless. And uh, there was a great movie that I think highlights this really well. Sometimes people have delusions around a number or around an idea. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, um, The Number 23. It's an interesting movie. Jim Carrey's in it, but he's not funny in it, which is always um, interesting in itself. But um, I have a little clip from it that I want to show you and came back to that number, right? Like, and sometimes even reversing that number to make it fit, like, and it doesn't always fit perfectly, but he's trying to make it in there. Very common with delusions of reference that people like perseverate or like uh, obsess over something specific. And for him, it was the number 23. Uh, really interesting at one point, his son kind of gets like dragged into it. Sometimes you can bring somebody else into your delusion. It's called a shared delusional disorder. Uh, and it can sometimes happen where somebody who's maybe very susceptible or very impressionable can get dragged into your delusion with you. Uh, there was a movie, and I, I even hesitate to write it because I'm not, not recommending it necessarily, but there was a movie called Bug. And I love creature films. Like, And I was like, ooh, bugs, that sounds like, that could be interesting, like a bug film as long as there aren't too many spiders in it, right? There's not a, not a damn bug in the whole movie, at least not a real bug anyway. Uh, but this guy in the movie has incredibly paranoid delusions. He definitely has schizophrenia. Has very deep delusional like um, presentations that are happening. And he drags this woman into it with him. And they just like absolutely believe that there are bugs everywhere. And in the end, like take each other out to avoid these bugs, right? Just wild psychological like movie in a way. I'm not sure I would say it was good, but it was interesting. Uh, sometimes we can actually pull people into a delusion and they start to believe it just as strongly as the one who originally held it. But the idea with delusions, again, is it's some sort of false belief, and but you act on it as if it is real. 
So it's more of the thought and belief that you have in contrast to like seeing things or hearing things that aren't actually there. Any um, any like thoughts or stories or anything with delusions, questions yet? Yeah, so psychosis, again, just means you've lost contact with reality, right? So if you truly believe that you are the president of the United States and you've embraced that delusion, right, then you've lost contact with reality and are psychotic. Um, and when people have that, then we tend to use schizophrenia as like a diagnosis for it. Yeah. Like a, kind of like your question, I right? think of it as more of like an umbrella term for any type of loss of contact with reality. Yeah. Is there like any specific age for the onset or manifestation of the, these kinds of things? Like, yeah. Does that age kind of determine what type of delusion you might have? So I don't know if it necessarily correlates with the, the type of delusion, but um, it tends to start younger for women than men. Women tend to first show signs of this in like their early 20s. Men, it's like late 20s, early 30s. Can also be something that's brought on by life events. Um, which we'll talk more about probably next time. But I had a young man in my class. He sat right in the front um, in a different classroom, but he sat like right in the front row. Uh, and he was in the early stages of schizophrenia. And this was like 10, 12 years ago. Um, and after this lecture, he came up to me and he was talking to me about it and really bright, like young guy in his like late twenties. Uh, you know, it tends to be something, unfortunately, that uh, happens like at a relatively young age for most but it could be triggered by a stressful or traumatic life event or a drug, um, even drug use later in life as well. So it tends to be like in the 20s. Loose associations, another really common one. You saw this with Gerald for sure, right? He uh, tended to have what is called derailment. It's almost like the train has jumped the tracks. So instead of your thoughts following like a clear path, uh, they tend to go all over the place. And when people are like manic, for example, or distracted, their thoughts might be kind of loosely connected, but these ones tend to be really, really like off of each other. Like, so they asked Gerald about the picture having a headache and he goes on to talk about egg and sperm meeting, right? Like completely unconnected. And that's something that you see a lot with loose associations. People have odd connections between thoughts in their head or no connection. They might have odd forms of speech where they rhyme or spell things out or do what's called clanging. Um, and I have an example of this if you've seen or the movie or read the book, The Soloist. It's another great example of someone with schizophrenia. Um, he has really intense loose associations. And I put the captions on because he mumbles and goes really quickly. Uh, but let me play this for you. This is a great example of what loose associations might look like. Just again, jumping from thing to thing to thing random, right? And that's something that you see a lot uh, with positive symptoms of schizophrenia, jumping all over the place. Again, almost like the train has jumped um, its tracks. Sometimes you also see spelling out of words the way that he did or rhyming, um, which we sometimes call clanging, where people will talk in like a really odd manner. But it's very common to jump from thing to thing to thing to thing. It's like the, the connection between them and the mind has been lost. And, and they tend to have a connection but it's not obvious to the people who are partaking in the conversation with them. Uh, so very, very common um, symptom, but by far the most common is the next one, uh, hallucinations. A lot of people, it's something like two thirds, if not more of people who have schizophrenia have hallucinations. And a hallucination is when you experience something uh, in the absence of any kind of external stimuli. So maybe hearing voices that aren't actually there or seeing things that aren't actually there, or feeling something on your skin and there's nothing there. The most common is hearing voices. Like uh, by like 66% or something like that, a lot of people with schizophrenia hear voices that aren't actually there. And I don't know about you, but I struggle to pay attention when people are even like talking around me, let alone if someone was literally yelling at me. And so what happens is sometimes people who have these hallucinations retreat from the world because they don't know what's real anymore, right? They can't function in conversations or in classes or in, in what, what not in anything because they have so much internal stimuli going on at any moment. And so it tends to kind of fuel itself, right? The more intense these are, the more people withdraw, which makes them more intense and it can just make the disorder worse and worse. So uh, by far the most common one, again, either seeing things, it could be people or objects, 
um, or hearing things that aren't actually there. And my very first job, um, I didn't get paid for it, but my first like psychology job that I did, I worked at a, or I volunteered, I should say, at a mental hospital down in San Diego that's now a YMCA, which just, again, still makes me laugh. Uh, but I was in group therapy rooms and my job was to just basically sit there and if somebody needed something, I'd go get it, right? I was like a runner, but I got to sit in on group therapy with all of these people. So I thought it was fascinating and I didn't care that I didn't get paid. I was just trying to get experience. And in the middle of group therapy, like this young woman starts screaming at this plant in the corner of the room. And I found out later she had schizophrenia, but she thought that the house plant in like the corner of the room was the devil and was telling her to murder all of us. And she like literally was screaming at this plant that I won't do it. I won't do it. I can, I won't kill them. And it was like the most interesting thing. I was like 17. I'm like, I know I want to be a psychologist. Right. Right. Then. Uh, but it was so fascinating, like seeing things or believing things that aren't there. are so common with this disorder and for her she's in pessimistic in nature well um, sometimes even frightening same movie uh the soloist i have an example he had a lot of auditory hallucinations and you can see how they kind of interfere with his ability to function so let me play an example of that for you um for him what you see in that clip right is he has a lot of delusions sorry let me go back here um he has a lot of delusions right he has this room in his garage which you often see in people who have like intense paranoia and conspiracy theories. He's got all these articles up and he's trying to connect things together. Um, but then he also has these interesting beliefs that like these people, he can see them because of like the cloaking serum, right? And all of this kind of odd stuff. But he sees these three individuals throughout his life that aren't real. He's hallucinating them and interacting with them, uh, which obviously appears quite odd to people like his wife on the outside. Uh, but it's very common to see things or hear things. If you've ever experienced a hallucination in any way, whether it's due to lack of sleep or a substance, uh, they can be scary. Right? Hallucinating things and not knowing what's real can be very frightening. And that's often the case uh, with people who have schizophrenia. They can be absolutely terrified uh, not knowing what's real and what isn't and interacting with these hallucinations that they're having. Yeah. Luke or like stress level affects what hallucinations like maybe you're just hallucinating about the bunnies everywhere or like, you know, mm -hmm. kill you. Sure. Yeah. And so for him, a lot of his delusions are very paranoid in nature, like his false beliefs. And so I think when that translates over to his hallucinations being kind of menacing, uh, they can oftentimes be just kind of neutral. For some people, it might even just be like you see things floating or like little shadows of things. Like when you're sleep deprived, you often see shadows of things that aren't there. Um, take that and ramp it up like times 50. Um, and oftentimes that's what people will experience. But it can be influenced by your mood. And your stress and like the beliefs that you have as well. Yeah. Any other like thoughts or comments or questions? Anything else about hallucinations at all? There's a woman who lives in Simi Valley, uh, but she sometimes comes up when we're talking about this. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen her. She's homeless. And I often see her like yelling and screaming at people like on the corner. Um, and we went to where were we? we were at Del Taco the other day and she was in there um, and like she was screaming at like this packet, like a like a mild sauce packet on her on her table. She was screaming at it and telling it what to do. And my kids were like, what's happening? I'm like, I'll tell you later. Right. Uh, but it's so interesting. Again, you see so much with homelessness with this because people can't function in society with these hallucinations or delusions unless they get treatment, right? And so they oftentimes kind of fall out of like the normal society, which tends to make things even, even worse. Uh, so again, very common, like two thirds of people with this disorder um, tend to have hallucinations. Oh, the last one on here, inappropriate affect, um, kind of the least of the ones that are up here, but it can be very damaging at times. It's when you display an emotion that's unsuited to the situation. And I guarantee every single person in this room has at least once reacted inappropriately <laughs> to a situation 
or maybe you laughed when you shouldn't have, or, you know, you kind of react like oddly. Uh, this is someone who's doing this constantly. So maybe they're laughing when um, it's something that's not funny, or they're screaming and upset um, in a happy moment. And oftentimes the reason that they're, inter they're acting so inappropriately is because they're interacting with something in their mind rather than the world around them. But it can obviously make a big impact socially and be a really big issue. Uh, interesting, I don't know how many of you saw the, the newer Joker movie, uh, but they kind of go the schizophrenia route with, uh, with his character. Really, really sad, hard to watch movie, in my opinion. Um, and they show him very much having inappropriate affect. He laughs in situations that aren't funny. Right. And they explain it as something called um, pseudo bulbular affect, which is when people tend to react inappropriately and kind of um, have emotional incontinence. They can't control their emotions. Um, I'll show you a short clip of it. It's, it's almost hard to watch, but he just laughs at like nothing. Right. He's constantly like laughing at things that emotions. It's kind of an interesting like variant on what this can look like. Uh, but the essence is that you're reacting typically to things that are more. Um, like internal. And so you're not reacting appropriately to the world around you because you're reacting to things that are inside of you. Um, and again, kind of an interesting take, uh, portraying him as someone with schizophrenia, which I thought was uh, really interesting. Again, a hard movie to watch, but uh, a really interesting take on this character. So uh, those are all the positive symptoms. Again, bizarre excesses or additions. Any other like comments or thoughts, stories, questions, anything else with the positive ones before we go to the the negative ones? Yes. Lots of movies, right? Uh, the negative symptoms are far less dramatic um, and they tend to be more common, right? Uh, but, but they're very like mild compared to the other ones in some way. Uh, negative symptoms of schizophrenia are deficits. So negative to here doesn't mean bad. It's the deficit. So things that aren't, that should be there that aren't. Uh, in your thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. One very common one is called alosia, or poverty of speech. It's very common for someone with schizophrenia, if they're portraying negative symptoms, um, to talk very little or very minimally. Uh, again, kind of an interesting take on um, a character, the Michael Myers, like the films, the Halloween films that were made, the newer ones, portray him as almost having like schizophrenia. He's in a catatonic state for 16 years as he stares out the window thinking about killing his sister, right? Or doesn't speak a word um, for all of that time. Definitely showing like Eloja is kind of, again, an interesting take on a classic character. But this is a very common symptom. Like you don't say anything or you speak very, very minimally. Uh, flat affect, where you don't have a lot of emotion. You're just kind of flat all the time, right? Not displaying a lot of emotional reactions to things. A loss of volition is when you don't have a lot of energy or desire to do anything. And so often what you see with these negative symptoms is somebody who's just like very flat all around. Like they might just sit there and do very little. They don't have a lot of emotion. They don't have a lot of speech. And as you can imagine, if you're not displaying any of these things, it makes it very difficult to interact with people around you. So people tend to withdraw. Right. They can't be around other people because they're not talking. They have no energy. They have no like interaction. And so they tend to withdraw and be on their own because it's more comfortable. But the more that they withdraw, the more that these things tend to increase. And again, it kind of goes round and round. So these symptoms are far less dramatic, but they're very common. Right. Not a lot of speech, not a lot of emotion, not a lot of drive or ambition or volition, desire to do anything, all of which lead to kind of being withdrawn and uh, being on your own. Very, very common with, with schizophrenia. And this used to be a subtype, right? Having negative um, symptoms of schizophrenia, but now it's just combined all, all together. The last group of symptoms uh, are the psychomotor ones. You saw this with Gerald, right? He kept spinning um, his hair the whole time. Very common that people, when they have psychomotor symptoms, have like an awkward movement or repeated movement or grimace or odd gestures that have a private purpose. So you might see somebody constantly going like this, right? And on the outside, it looks like they're doing nothing, but in their mind, they're pushing a button. And if they don't push the button, something bad's gonna happen, right? Or uh, maybe they're stuck in an odd position like this or spinning their hair in circles because they can't stop. 
it's a, a variety of different presentations here. Uh, so it could be that somebody has like weird facial expressions and movements, or sometimes the other way you see this is people become catatonic. And when someone is catatonic or displaying catatonia, they get what's called a catatonic stupor. They might not move or talk, and they almost get stuck in a position for long periods of time. It's like they're in a form of extreme dissociation from the world around them. And that's what you see in this image here. And there was a video, and I've tried so hard to find it, but I couldn't. Um, this guy was walking and he's walking and like mid walk, he just stops. And like, he's frozen like that for like, I forget, I think it was like 20 something minutes. And then he just keeps walking like nothing happened. And in that time that he was frozen, people try and move him and talk to him and interact with him. And he's almost like rigid and closed off to the world around him. And that's something that you sometimes see with this, again, back to the Michael Myers example, he doesn't talk and he just sits there and stares out a window, right? And that's very typical of someone in a catatonic state. Super difficult to find an example of this, but I found an example of it from an old movie. Um, the movie was called, oh shoot, I just forgot the name of it. Uh, I wrote it down though. Uh, Patch Adams, that had Robin Williams in it. Um, but this movie, he's in a psychiatric hospital and there's a guy in their group therapy named Beanie who has a catatonic stupor. And you'll notice he's stuck. He has like his arms stuck up in the air and he's not reacting to anything around him. Really cool in this clip, there's a, this example of what we call waxy flexibility. And we don't know how to explain this, but it's really interesting. Like he takes his hand and he moves it and it almost moves like a statue, like it was made of wax instead of like having weight to it. Like if you were to leave your arm out for a while, it starts to get heavy, right? But in this scene, like it's almost like they move it and he just kind of move it. You can see him put his arm down as if it were almost like a statue. And that's very typical of this. They did their research well. Uh, so a little insensitive, they're in like group therapy and it gets really out of control. Uh, but pay attention to the guy named Beanie who is in a catatonic stupor. Right, let me show you this. Um, again, kind of inappropriate, but you see Beanie having catatonic schizophrenia, but like he's stuck in that position. Uh, really great like portrayal of that. He lifts up his arm to check his wristband and his arm just kind of stays there and then he just pushes it back down. And that's that waxy flexibility that you sometimes see with this. Um, again, getting stuck in odd positions, like he's stuck with his arm up like that. And the wild thing is we don't understand what's happening in this state, like we've tried to do um, brain scans, we try to ask people what's happening, but because of the nature of the disorder, the question, the answers that we get aren't super reliable. Well, the devil had me frozen and that's why I'm stuck in that position and couldn't speak. And not overly helpful, even if they believe that to be the case. Um, so very uh, interesting that this can happen. It's more common to see like what Gerald had, which is like spinning or like an odd grimace or movement. Uh, but people can get stuck in these kind of catatonic stupors where they don't interact with the world around them and they have that rigidity and waxy flexibility as well. And this used to be its own subtype as well. Psychomotor uh, schizophrenia was its own type um, and then they absorbed it in just like everything, everything else. Any um, thoughts or questions or stories, comments or anything here with psychomotor schizophrenia stuff? Yeah. Uh, those are all the different symptoms or like the big ones or, or some other smaller ones. But somebody in order to be diagnosed with schizophrenia has some combination of those positive, negative or psychomotor symptoms present. And depending on what they have, right, it dictates treatment and how we're going to approach it. Uh, a little bit, um, let's go through one more slide or two and then we'll um, be close to the end here. But with the course of schizophrenia, kind of like you were asking earlier, this tends to be something that uh, tends to appear in like the 20s, but it can be like late teens to 30s is the most common. Um, as I said, a little bit later in men um, than in women. And it tends to follow three distinct phases. So not everybody goes through all three, but this would be a great short answer question, right? What are the three phases of schizophrenia? Uh, and they are prodromal, active, and residual. And so what you often see is that people start in what's called the prodromal phase. And you could kind of see this with Jamie Foxx's character when he's saying like, I'm not sure what's real and what isn't. That's very common in that prodromal phase. And as I mentioned, the student that I had, he kept telling me, I'm not sure when I'm dreaming and when I'm awake. I'm not sure if somebody said something or if I imagined it. 
And it's very common in this early um, phase. People are like starting to maybe deteriorate a little bit. They're having a hard time. They're slipping in their work and in their classes and whatnot, but they're still kind of hanging in there. They're just not sure what's real and what isn't. And about 25% of people never go beyond here. It kind of stays at this prodromal phase. They might not even require treatment um, depending on the severity, but about 50% of people end up in what's called the active phase of schizophrenia. This is when all of your symptoms are, they're apparent, they're full-blown. People in the active phase require treatment. They're not able to function on their own, typically not able to like maintain the responsibilities. So for some, again, it can stay prodromal, about 50% goes to active. And then the other 25% end up in what's called the residual phase. So for some people, it starts, they have active schizophrenia and then it just kind of goes away, right? And they return to like, a prodromal level of functioning. Maybe they have a few little symptoms, but it's manageable. For others, they stay in the active phase and require treatment their entire life. They might require medication or hospitalization or just intense supervision, while others might go back um, to here. And in A Beautiful Mind, uh, he learns to live with his schizophrenia. Really, really bright guy. And sadly, schizophrenia does tend to affect people who are very intelligent. There's a very strong correlation between intelligence and schizophrenia. Um, and so in this movie, as I mentioned, he learns to recognize when things are real or not real, right? And that really helps him to stay grounded a little bit. So by recognizing that the hallucinations, the people never age, he learns to almost like harness that in a way that allows him to function, right? And so when people are able to do that, like that helps quite a bit, kind of challenging those beliefs, having good support can be really helpful. But a good chunk, like 50% of people, if not a little bit more, require medication and supervision because their symptoms are, are severe. Yeah. No, right. Um, I mean, not that we know it, but like there is some thoughts that there is a genetic component to it. Uh, there was a study a couple of years ago where they found like some genetic expressions um, and I'm forgetting the specific gene. Um, it was this whole long like meta analysis that they did, but they found some genetic like correlates to schizophrenia. And so it's thought that it has something to do with genetics, something to do with intelligence. We'll talk a little bit. Um, it's very chemically driven as well, but I'm not sure that we know. There's so much that we don't know, which sometimes is, is maddening but it does tend to sometimes appear in people who are quite bright. Um, and like, you see that in the soloist, you see that in a beautiful mind as well. Um, it's very common and even in, in Patch Adams a little bit as well. Um, so it's something that we've noticed a lot, but I'm not sure we can explain. Other thoughts or comments, questions, anything else here? So uh, from here, what we'll look at, uh, we'll look at, how we can explain what causes schizophrenia and what treats it. But I think I'll stop here rather than jump into this as we as we come back from break, everyone looks tired, right? Even though we had a week off, we're all we're all ready for another break. Four weeks and it's over. Um we're like a month. So um what I'll do is I'll stop here for today and then when I see you on Wednesday, we'll pick up, we'll talk about explaining and treating schizophrenia. And then um, we'll probably also move on a little bit to personality disorder, start that chapter. Um, if you have any like questions or anything about your paper or about anything from like last week, I'll hang out for a few minutes. Otherwise, it's nice to see you all again. I'll see you all on uh, on Wednesday.